Nice to see you here. I uh, hope I don't put you into your after lunch food coma. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, here's a little brain teaser to keep you occupied during the talk. So if you've seen it, it probably won't keep you happy for very long. Uh, I don't think it will be on the Hackers Challenge leaderboard, so it's not going to help you there. Um, but think about that. The answer will be at the end if you're still here. Yeah. Okay, so our, our agenda is pretty simple. We're going to set the stage talking about AppSec and why it's important and why companies need to really be thinking about application security now, especially if they're developing products. It's very important to them. So we'll cover a lot of material, so I apologize for this. This is a um, uh, PowerPoint slide bomb. I've learned earlier today that I need a lot more happy kitties or other things like that, but I did try to put in a couple of... Uh, cartoons in it to keep you entertained and pull you along on the journey. But we'll look at what makes an app, uh, AppSec program uh, and then specifically look at three things, which is security champions, threat modeling, and S-bombs. And then there's uh, some Appendix material that we're not going to look at. But this is the first time that AppSec has featured prominently at SaintCon. Um, there are, last year I submitted this talk and it wasn't accepted. This year it was, and there's three other talks that you can go to if you're interested in application security. Uh, first one is uh, Kenton McDaniel, who's talking uh, tomorrow about application security maturity models. Hope that doesn't overlap too much with what I said. <laughs> uh, and then coding secure without becoming a hacker is also on Thursday. And then on Friday, there's a plunge, putting the SEC back into DevSecOps. So, uh, check them out, and there's an AppSec community village down there if you want to try your chops at AppSec. Okay, okay this is the obligatory who am I slide, uh, and this is where I say everything I say here is my own opinion, does not necessarily reflect the opinions of my employer or my boss who is in the crowd, so hopefully I don't get fired by the end of the day. So, um, I am a long-time software developer. I spent a, a years, an entire career being a software engineer before I switched over to security. Um, I got my first job as a software engineer before I got my first degree. And then I slightly overcompensated and went and got a PhD. So, um, uh, big, long, interesting journey. Everybody takes a different path to security. So you have a different background and that diverse background is very important to have. Um, I currently work for Arctic Wolf, which has a booth down in the front lobby. If you do, uh, do some, uh, I think if you post something on LinkedIn, you can get a special mini badge from them, so go check it out. This is my third time presenting at SaintCon. The other two times have been upstairs doing an introduction to Python class. So, and, but that's enough about me. Now, earlier today, somebody mentioned that executive sponsorship is very important. So. That's a given, so this isn't even before we started the setting the stage stuff. We're in the still the front matter. If you don't have executive support, things are not going to work out so well for you. It is very important, and enough said on that. So that's why it says it at the bottom. You can't get it done if you don't have the buy-in from upper management. All right, so we're going to set the stage. Who has, who has developers on staff doing stuff now, and do you have an AppSec program? Okay. Does your AppSec program look something like this? Security guys tell developers about specific vulnerabilities, and then it goes into a black box. They may figure it out. They say it's fixed, and it comes back to you. And then, invariably, security finds other flaws, and the security guys complain when a breach happens. Does that sound like security at your place? Nobody? No? Okay. okay. Uh, it's uh, pretty common. This is actually David Rook and Principles of Security Deve Development from OWASP Ireland con Conference back in 2009. So things haven't really changed that much in the 13 years since he put those slides. So I did steal them. I hope that's enough of copyright notice for it. Okay. All right. Most places have a different approach to it, and that's everything is fine. Right? We do a little bit. We have GitHub Advanced Security. It covers our bases. We, we are taking care of our vulnerabilities. But that, uh, hey, it skipped a slide. That's neat. Sweet. You guys don't get to see the everything is fine uh, <laughs> uh, meme of the burning house because that was there. Um, oh, there it is. Everything is fine. 
That, that's how it typically works, right? But is it? In the last couple of years, we've had a lot of different things that come through. We've had Log4j. If you're a developer, that probably ruined a Christmas for you a couple of years ago. Um, Spring for Shell, more recently. Proxy not shells going around now. That's a, a, a current one. Uh, div, uh, different types of repository poisoning is going on where different uh, actors, where they're environment activists or just people upset with the system are poten uh, intentionally corrupting GitHub repos and in injecting vulnerabilities into them. And then there was SolarWinds. Anybody heard of SolarWinds? No? It's not, not, a, not a new thing for you? All right. Um, the interesting thing about SolarWinds is everybody I've talked to about SolarWinds, I've asked some very specific questions about it. And it's like, do you know what happened? And, and what was your company's response for it? And their company's inver uh, response was invariably, we patched SolarWinds. Nobody ever stopped to think about if that trusted software that was signed by the development process was compromised, how has that happened? And how do we prevent that from happening in our own organizations? Right? Does anybody know how SolarWinds got compromised? They haven't really said who, but I believe the password, it was a network compromise of a server with the network password of password123. Uh, I think I heard that somewhere. I don't have a source to quote that on. But they got in, got on the network, compromised the build server, didn't modify the source code repository, didn't modify anything, except they installed malware on the build server. And that malware did a specific thing. It looked for a specific file to be written on the file system, and it overwrote it. And then it just got happily built. There was no evidence left behind after the malware was removed. And it was only because a security researcher noticed suspicious network traffic after it got released. So you have WAF. WAF will protect that, right? That, that's the common theme at most security conferences for a long time is, you have a WAF, right? And the nervous chuckles from the groups in the back going, yeah, no, we, we don't really have one yet. Well, they're more common now, but you don't really know how you're going to, um, how they're used, and every time something comes up, you poke another hole in it. Pretty soon it's Swiss cheese and it collapse. So, Oversight is coming. You can see this coming from compliance frameworks, governments, uh, and the most important one is uh, Executive Order uh, 14, uh, 14028, which came out from Biden's administration last year. But there's other ones. Um, back in February of 21, there was Executive Order 1417, which instructed people to start improving their supply chains. Zero Trust Reference Architecture came out from NIST. Um, and the most recent thing coming out from this is the minimum definition of, of an S-bomb. We'll be talking about that one a little bit later. There's a specific section on that. But uh, it's not just America that is having. This, this uh, slide is all about American forcing, America forcing improved uh, software security. This one is different countries doing the same thing. So Great Britain, Germany, um, the European Union as a whole, and then the, uh, the Trade and Technology Council has been put in place. All of them are working on different things to help make sure that application security is a forerunner in, um, in thoughts and, co and contracts for government organizations. And selling software is what we do. Selling software to governments is always looked after by your... Uh, uh, sales team, so if you can't support them by having the processes that will ma be made, you'll be missing that opportunity, and one of your competitors will have that opportunity. Yeah. You typically come into a lot of different reasons or excuses for why um, software security can't be built in now. And those really come into a lot of different things. It's good enough for now. These risks are not relevant. It's not the number one pri priority. It's, it's just a pilot project that ends up invariably being in production. We're changing too fast. Your controls will slow us down. We depend on third-party solutions. We don't want rigid. We're agile. We, we can't do it. Uh, other challenges is there's so many frameworks out there. 
There's the NIST CSF. There's ISO 27001. There's CIS uh, controls, which is the top 20. Anybody familiar with this? Well, it's 18 now when they revise it. Anybody familiar with the CIS controls? There's one section in there that's about that long about application security. And you're supposed to cover everything in it. So, um, and the other option is there's lack of developer team buy-in. You have uh, a team that is responsible for delivering features. And you have another team that's telling them that they need to slow down, that they need to be careful that they need to think and engineer the solutions that they have. That, that's a different rant I have of whether or not your organization calls somebody a developer or a programmer or an engineer. Those all have three distinct meanings to me. So we want to have software engineers and engineering is a process that is rigid and followed. It can be fast, but you have to have a process and it have to, has to be repeatable. And most of the features that the development teams are already working on Oh, well, they're, they're probably behind schedule because they're optimistic when they make the big guesses about how long something will take, and when they start to break it down, they realize it's a lot more complex. So you have times. Now, some days, if you're doing AppSec, it's going to feel like this. But here's my question for you. Who do, I th who do you think I see as the application security team? Agent Smith. Because that's what engineering thinks that they're Neo. So you have to fill the role of Agent Smith. So, <laughs> okay, keep that in mind. It, it, as a matter of perspective, security team members are going to think, yes, I'm doing the right thing, but you are seen as an impediment to Neo accomplishing his mission. Now, there, I can go ad, ad nauseum about different reasons why this is needed. So there's headlines all the time that, that you can see. Um, uh, and most of these repeat the things we've already talked about, but um, mobile Trojans being distributed by mods, app developers increasingly targeted by Slack and DevOps tools. So the, the attackers have learned that there is a nice soft underbelly out of the hard shell that most IT security systems put in place. And if you get in, you can have practically free range. Because if you think about it, when, when your network security team is prioritizing what work they are going to do, do they prioritize a server or a developer's laptop? They, they prioritize the server, right? Because that's what makes the money. But if they compromise a developer's laptop and that laptop has SSH, SSH keys into AWS or whatever other system that they have, that's a low criticality system that might not have as much rigid controls on it as you might need to have. Some more, my popular one is popular IoT cameras need patching to fend off catastrophic attacks. That's uh, like right up there with the killer light bulbs that you, you've heard about recently in the news. So, um, so if we take a look at the top 20 um, actively exploited items that exist in 2021, you can see that about 25% of them are related to application security. There's the log4j, that one's going to be up there for years. Um, uh, somebody stated that it would take decades for that to be truly remediated, but I can't think of another company that has, has not come out and said, oh, we're not affected by it, we patched it, we're good. There is way too much Java code out there for that to be true because we have software that has had defects for decades that is still not being taken care of. Um, then there's the other question. If on day one, somebody says they're not affected for, for log4j, it says, yeah, yeah, great. They're not using for log4j. But what about solar winds? You know, oh, we're not affected by it. Does that mean they don't have solar winds or they have solar winds and it was running an even older version of it, so they're not even, they don't even have a good patch management strategy in place. So, um, so a a log4j, GitHub vulnerabilities, Atlassian vulnerabilities, a um, couple of them were Atlassian, Sitecore, which is a um, uh, marketing website management system, and uh, the Apache HTTP server all have had critical attacks 
that have known exploits that are really easy to script, so script kitties can do it too. So, here. Um, so I, I think we've clearly d demonstrated the need for application security in an organization, but let's think about how it gets rolled out. There's basically four phrases, phases that this happens in. Uh, the, a reactive, a baseline, an expanded, and an advanced one. The reactive one is what really happens when you first decide, hey, we're going to have an AppSec team. And that's, you start hearing about vulnerabilities, and you take them to the security team. Rea baseline is, okay, we're starting to get a little bit of handle of this. Maybe we'll roll out some tools. We'll start defining our processes. We'll work on it. But everything is building up to ha having an advanced area and uh, advanced capabilities in it, where you're proactively seeking and searching for them. And that is through whatever means you have, whether it's pen testing, uh, unit test, misuse, abuse cases, internal testing, QA, writing requirements up front. And that's your ultimate goal. But what is the AppSex team's role in application security? I've already hit on it. It's not what you think. It's not about you, it's about them. Your role is to build trust. Simply put, just build trust with the development teams. And you need to make it so that it looks like a unifying effort. So here you see a fire support team where there is a person in the trench with the developer providing active support for them. Okay. If you look at the dev SecOps model, you can see that it's pretty easy. It says dev, QA, ops, and in the middle it's DevOps. It's been a trend lately to calling that dev SecOps. So that, that's a good nod that security is becoming important. But uh, the DevOps aficionados will say it's always been there. It's always been in the manifesto. There's a little teeny font that says security in it. So, it's a team sport, you're part of the team, you need to integrate into this DevSecOps model because that's how software is done. You're not gonna be able to change that, you need to work in that model. So it's like a team sport, and a team sport I did not know much about was rugby, right? I did not know they had so many positions, and I don't know why I can't see my notes, but so we're gonna be winging this because I still don't know all these positions. Um, but there are different, different positions that they have. They are highly specified, uh, specialized. And that's the main point of the slide is you have props, hookers, locks, flankers, the number eight man who is like the center in soccer. You have quarterbacks who is their star from American football, wingers, centers, and fullbacks. Each of them have a specific role, and that role is very specific to what they do. And when the development team says, we have a handle on security, what specialization does that have? Right. We, we can take care of security because we're already taking care of all the other abilities. We're taking about reliability, sustainability, uh, resilience. But unless they staff for it and they have people that are dedicated and have time for it, they, they can't stay on top of all the changing that is going on. It's just not possible for them to do that. And if you look at the structure of most development teams. Here's a sample of some that I um, pulled off of the internet while I was preparing for this. This is your standard application security, uh, or your standard development team. Where is security in this model? Here's another one. Where is security in this model? A third, no security. A fourth, no security. A fifth, no security. And a sixth. No security. So development teams aren't staffing for this. So they can't take it on. They don't know how to do it. So, so uh, as we already said, development, developers already have a lot to remember. It's impossible for them to keep track of this. Would you rather have a cardiac surgeon operate on your heart or your GP? Um, also, internally, if you're making decisions about yourself, your opinion is going to be biased. You're going to think you're doing better. This happens even on security teams. Security teams might think that, oh, our processes are good enough. We're catching it. We have a good enough development. I'm sure SolarWinds thought that. 
but they had the Pearl Harbor of attacks. So the, the, somebody was thinking out of the box and figured out a way to get past them. All right. And then if you look at your DevOps models, who has DevOps teams that actually have minimized rights? Or do all developers, because they're all DevOps, all have rights? So even though you have a DevOps model, your, <laughs> your authentication method really looks like this. Your authorization roles is an overlapping, developers can do everything everywhere, which means that it's really critical <laughs> for them to have it, have lockdown computers and have plans for addressing that in a need to know limited rights type manner. So to get it right, it's, it's getting back to the basics. It's getting back to the fundamentals, making sure that you have better workflow. Uh, if you have an AppSec program and you have employed it right, it makes it so that you have the ability to have better workflows, better remediation, better overall management, but, and safer products, better reputation, higher qualities, which might mean less cost because you're not paying out afterwards, uh, seamless co collaboration among teams. So that I haven't quite seen. I've seen collaboration among teams still working on the seamless part. It, it, it's a love-hate relationship. Um, um, going back to the higher quality results for less cost, I, I can't remember who said it, but I heard somebody say once that the difference between a pen test and a breach is only when you negotiate the cost. Right? So. All right. so this is the part that will bore you to death. We're going to talk about a lot of different frameworks that exist out there, and you can see where you might have to start if you're building it up from scratch, or what resources you might have that will be useful for you if, um, uh, if you already have something in place on coming into thinking about which controls that you might have to put into place. Okay. Uh, the first one, the easiest one to start with, is uh, Microsoft has their Secure Development Lifecycle website. There is lots of material out in there. Um, depending on how close you've looked, maybe you've discovered the Microsoft SDL portion of that. But a couple clicks on this, you can see that they have an operational security architecture and a secure DevOps. And if you dig really close, they even have some content on how to do agile SDL within their, within their organization. Um, the Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle has 12 simple things that you can do to get started. Number one is provide training. In all Microsoft frameworks, number one is provide training. Now, that's a little bit of an edgy topic because I can't think of any place that has actual good training. I see plenty of things that have awareness, but nothing that actually develop, tells a developer how to code securely. And anything that's done ad hoc in-house usually is done with the security engineer in mind where they say, hey, if you don't do this, you have a um, SQL injection or something like that. And they talk about it in terms and terminology that is familiar to the security engineer, not in terms that the, engine, the software engineer will work on. So, um, Defining security, we're not going to go through all of them. We're just going to, so bear with me. Well, we're just going to go through this one pretty quick. Defining security requirements. That's important. Everything that you do after the developer is done is reactive. So by having security requirements, you're doing things up front. You're working to address the problems when it has a lower cost, when it is easier to fix, and before the developers consider it themselves done. Uh, all businesses run on metrics and compliance reporting, so you have to have KPIs to go with it. Performing threat modeling is one of the tenets. You saw that as one of the three things that I single out we'll talk more about, and that's because threat modeling allows the developers to start talking about the designs that they have and gives a forum for the software se and the application security engineers and the software engineers to collaborate in a freeform space. And there are ways to do it that are not formal, that are engaging, and make it a lot less painful process. Okay? Um, design requirements goes kind of hand in hand with the security requirements, putting them up front. Uh, make sure your company has uh, cryptography standards and using them. Uh, number seven is an important one, is managing the security risk of third-party components. That's 
all why there's news or talk about S-bombs or third-party compromises, and then use approved tools. How many places have dedicated IDEs that they use, or is it anything that they want to use, or how do you control even what gets put onto a server? How do you harden your image? And then SAS, DAS, penetration testing, and establish an incident response process. You might not have to establish an incident response process because most places already have one, and you just need to figure out how to interface with it effectively. Right? So we'll start going through these a little bit faster. On the other side, they have the operational security assurance, which if you think about it, it's with the DevOps or DevSecOps, everything's coming together and developers are doing more. So you have to think about the coding aspects, you have to think about the hosting aspects, and have to make sure that you address all of that in your application security program. So uh, on the operational side, they're looking about how, how the controls are uh, put in place for authentication, how least privilege, and this isn't in the application you're writing, this is in the software that you're hosting or running. Uh, making sure that you have your WAF, your RASP, your IAST, and if you don't know what any of those tools are, I can tell you, tell you what those are later. Um, but protecting against DDoS attacks and making sure that you have hardened configurations. And again, perform penetration testing because that's still the number one way to find out how you're going to get attacked is to try it again. Um, Microsoft has a framework for trying to manage your supply chain. Number three is the most important thing, and that is inventory. Does your company have an asset inventory system? Okay, I don't see any hands, so that's just scary. So, <laughs> okay. 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 all right, so can't even ask the follow-ons to that because I didn't see any hands, but does that asset inventory go down into the containers that are running? Does that, do you know what software is running on that container? Which team owns that software? And where to find that software in your source code version control system? And then more secure DevOps stuff. So, and that's where they start talking about software composition analysis and protecting. So it all ties together. There is another company out there that exists. It's called, uh, well, I don't want to say the name of the company, but they have a product called BSIM, and that stands for Build Security and Maturity Model. I'm sure if you Google that, the company name will pop up really quickly. Um, they do a report every year on the controls that make the most sense, and their controls are broken down into governance, intelligence, S SSDL touch points, and development, and each of those Controls have three different sections. So governance has strategy and metrics, compliance and policy and training. And then uh, I, you can read that. I'm not going to do it, uh, do it for you. Uh, so the most important thing from there is they also say what their top 10 activities are. So if you start looking at the items that they have, they're leaning heavily on things that security teams do well already. So the number 10 thing, and I really wish I could see my notes, which gave me the percentages, oops, um, is translate compliance. This was done about 79% of the time. Uh, integrate and deliver security features, that's actually good because that's talking about building features into your products. Um, if I recall correctly, that was 82% of the time. Uh, integrate and deliver security, feed. that's what I just did. Use automated tool code review tools. That's when you roll out your SaaS tools. And all a SaaS tool is, is a tool that automates the process that code reviews accomplishes. It's best done inside of an IDE while the developers are working. A lot of companies choose to implement this as a step in their build process where they will, on a pull request, reject something. But that's after the developer may consider themselves done. Or what scares me more is they rely on the pull request to tell them that they're not done. Because that doesn't sound like engineering to me. So, right, it's like, oh, well, let's see if this works. Which, which um, it's kind of like back when I was in college, which was a really, really long time ago, slightly after they got light bulbs. So uh, I would go work and submit a program on a mini computer, submit it to compile, go eat lunch, play a couple of video games in the cafeteria, come back and see if the compile was done and find out that I forgot a semicolon on line 37. So it's not an effective use of time. Okay. Um, 
perform edge boundary testing in QA. If your, team, if your development team happens to have a QA department, that's great. Most uh, DevSecOps teams I know have gotten rid of QA because the developers are responsible for the security, which means that they are very good at testing the happy path for their stuff and not very good at thinking about the bad path or in particular the evil path. Um, security review features, get extra eyes on it. That's always a good concept. External penetration testing, that's an important one. Why external? That's because external brings a fresh set of eyes as well. Internal, you start testing the same things. And we like to change the pen tester that we use because if you use the same one year over year, they're probably not going to find anything, especially if you get the same guy in the engagement. Uh, again, interface with um, incident response. I think we're in the uh, high 80s now. I think 87% for this one. 87% of companies here. Um, engage in this activity. And then ident identity, identify privacy obligations. This obviously comes from global businesses wanting to support GDPR or any of the other privacy frameworks out there. And then the things that we're really good at is ensure you have the CIS controls in place because we've been doing that for decades and implement security checkpoints and associated governance. So we're pretty good at saying, hey, we need to stop stuff because our GRC department says so. But we aren't good at practicing ourselves and making sure that we have checks in that are, aren't required. Okay. Um, that one's only 90% of the time. The only one thing that happens in BSIM from all 100, uh, uh, that happens 100% in time in the 113 people that participate in the survey every year is that they have an application security team instead of pawning it off on engineering. Okay. Um, there's another framework. This is OpenSAM. That comes from the uh, uh, OWASP. Well, it doesn't come from it, but OWASP has pick it, taken it up and it's now an OWASP flagship project. It's designed in a similar manner. Actually, if you look at the history of it, BSIM went this way and OSAM, uh, OSAM went that way. So they have different controls underneath it, underneath it, but it breaks it down into governance practices, design practices, implementation practices, and verification practices. Okay. Oops, and operations. Put the and in there in the wrong place. Um, more recently, there's SP800-218. Now, anybody that's gone out after FedRAMP is probably familiar with SP800-53, because that's the big 400-page document with uh, all the wonderful controls that you have to have. But this is what came out in response to Biden's executive. Well, it existed before, but it can be used to address the, the, um, the controls. Uh, if you're pursuing FedRAMP, again, have to understand that. You have to start considering state RAMP. Or, uh, well, I think it's going away, but there's Texas ramp too, or Tex ramp. So that's going to fall back down into state ramp. So that's the logos for all of them. You can be uh, uh, ready, provisional, or what's that last one? Authorized under that one. Um, so under NIST, and that really does not work good on the screen. I apologize for that. Um, it's prepare the organization, protect the, uh, the software, produce well-secured software, and respond to vulnerabilities. So it's, it's nice, easy practice. These are all easy to Google, but uh, similar type controls that you've seen from the other ones, so we won't spend too much time on them. Um, and then, if you happen to take credit cards, there's PCI DSS, which has some controls that are very similar to it, like build and maintain a secure network, protect account data, build and maintain a vulnerability program. Um, the interesting thing about PCI DSS is it says you have to secure the data in transit if it's over a public network. So if it's on a private network, they don't care. So. I think that's wrong. Um, PCI also, oh, sorry about that, also has a secure software uh, framework that it makes it easier for you to start implementing the things that are covered under the PCI DSS spec. They go hand in hand, they map back and forth between the two. Uh, number 11 there is secure software updates. So uh, that, that's, uh, 
there are more frameworks out there. Those are the top ones that if you're building an AppSec program, you need to think about and make sure that you write your controls to adjust to it. So if we're thinking about how do we get started with this? And hopefully I can finish before my plugged in computer dies because it says my battery is almost gone. All right. <laughs> um, there's no blueprint for your company. I can't tell you exactly what you need to do, but I can tell you that there's six things that you sh should consider doing. Involve the development team early. Uh, access where your organization is at. Take a good hard look. Know exactly where the bodies are buried, which bodies you need to bury up and dig up first and start working on them. Have an asset inventory, and that asset inventory isn't just what computers you have or what IT is watching. It has to be everything whether it's a corporate system, whether it's a AWS cloud resource, even if it's you know, something that just lives there for a while, you need to understand the process that builds it and when it will show up and when it will disappear. Uh, know what you have in the threat modeling. Automate, automate, and automate. There's no way that you can do this without automation. You won't scale. You have to make sure that every, as much as you can do is automated. And then test, evaluate, and report, and then obviously rinse and repeat because it's a continual process. It's a program, not a project. Places that go in and look at something as a project for AppSec will never really do a good thing because you'll get a little bit of time, once a sprint, once a quarter, once a year or something like that, instead of changing the culture that you need to have. You have to have a security culture like they were saying in the keynotes earlier today. And one of the best ways to involve the development team early is to have a security champion. This is a concept that comes out of BSUM, and that's a really long um, uh, bit of verbiage for anybody who gets the uh, slides later to remember what I was talking about at this time. Um, but the important thing is the security champions are resources on the engineering team. They are the developers. They have stepped up and said, I will own security for my team, okay? The, the benefits for them is it looks good on their resume, depending on how you roll it out, they can get incentives or, you know, um, one of the companies I worked for before, if you were a security champion and you had enough active involvement in it, they would send that champion to Black Hat. Of course, not all champions are motivated by that, so you have to think about your target audience and what motivates them. Some of them might be have, fine with just money. Um, right. So the champion's role is specifically to give the security team, somebody on the engineering team that's directly responsible for it, a uh, bi-directional pipe for communication. The, the champion can come to the engineer saying, hey, this is what we're working on. We need to think about how to do it securely and get advice from him. And then the security champion can receive from application security the, anything that's coming down the pipe that might affect them. Like, hey, we heard from marketing that we're going after FedRAMP. That type of surprise might put a damper in the software engineer's day when they realize that they have to meet all these controls, make sure that they're able to host in a different area, and review all of the components that make up their system and make sure that they are FedRAMP authorized. So, yeah. um, it's the only way to allow uh, security efforts to scale, right? Uh, application security engineers are one, hard to find, two, expensive, and three, um, I don't know the best way to put this. They <laughs> just say that they're, they're overworked just like everybody else in the organization. So um, you have to have a ratio, a, a small team of application security engineers cannot work with 600 developers effectively. If you have five, uh, five application security engineers trying to talk to 600 developers, that's going to make application security a bottleneck for them. But if you have a different model and it's, you have one application security engineer for 10 champions per 100 developers, now you have a very, a very good way to scale, right? It, it, it adds a layer of indirection that can help out. Um, it also puts somebody on the development team that helps spread that culture within the, uh, within the 
development and team because if he's taking it to them, they respect him. They might not respect you unless you happen to be like me and poach people from the engineering team for your application security team. Um, and if marketed correctly, it can be a competitive differentiator. Okay, ISO 27001 is not hard to get. You have to be right 70% of the time to get that certification. Lots of companies have an ISO 27001. Lots of companies that have been breached have an ISO 27001, right? But if you can demonstrate and market that you have a secure product, especially if you have something like a bug bounty program to work on it. Um, so how do you start a champion program? You need to decide what you want to accomplish. You need to decide who is going to participate. Now, earlier I said that it's very important that this is a volunteer effort, right? Sometimes this becomes voluntold, but you really want it to be a volunteer effort because that way you find somebody that's passionate about it, who's interested in it already. You need to clearly define what is expected of them. And again, going back to the training, how, how will you prepare them for the task? And again, upper management support. And how do you keep the champions interested? And that's the gamification that I talked about earlier. Um, so, then threat modeling. Threat modeling is usually the second thing I do. The first thing is adding a software security champion uh, program so that you have somebody to do the threat modeling with. Now, application security engineers can do a threat model on their own, but that's not the most effective way to do it. The best way is to get in a room with your application security engineer, your security champion, and hopefully the entire development team if you can take, a, take the time. And really start getting into what the pro process and business function of the software that you're looking at is for. So you start with identifying what objectives you want to have. Then you look at an applica application overview. This is really great if your development team already has data flow diagrams and flow charts and things that you can work on, or that might be one of the findings that you have from this is that we need these before we can do that. Um, you break apart and decompose the application. The most important thing there is to think about the trust boundaries that any data might cross and how you protect the data as it crosses those trust boundaries. Uh, start thinking about threats against the system and how to identify vulnerabilities. Uh, the most common method for that is STRIDE. It's an acronym for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. Okay, so um, another common way of, uh, another common thing to consider at the same time is privacy. Uh, a previous company that I've worked with, there, there's a game called Elevation of Privilege. We added a privacy deck to that, and uh, we'll actually see that here in a little bit. But there's also another common way to think about threats, and that's attack trees, where you want to discover vulnerabilities that instead of just thinking of, here's a request and a response on what the problem is. This takes a more uh, overall approach at it and you can find multi-step multi attacks. And you start thinking about what it takes to compromise each stage of that. And it's a much more detailed and rigorous process. Um, from the adversary's viewpoint, you think about how much will it cost them to launch the attack? What's the effort to set up and effort to execute? What are the required tools and skills? And what is their ROI? So, and then from the defender side, you got to think about what is the impact of the attack? What's the cost of the failure? What's the likelihood that your security operations team is going to be able to detect it? And what is the lowest cost countermeasure that you can effectively deploy to at least reduce the, 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 prob the impact to a reasonable amount? And here's a common example of what an attack track attack tree looks like. So in the middle, it's we, a web application was compromised because of a uh, configuration file modification with modules in the web directory, and the ink file was, could be displayed in text form. So, and it's a very visual, it's easy to work through. And I'll admit, looking at this, kind of boring. Developers don't like to do it. Their eyes will glaze over. So back to that gamification that we're talking about. Uh, Microsoft has the Elevation of Privilege card game. It goes against the stride. Um, there's a OS cornucopia, which has a different set of controls that you need to work with. 
And then uh, the one I found while I was researching for this, and I need to take a closer look at it, is the um, uh, attack patterns one in the middle. Okay. Now, let, let's go back and take a look at S-bombs. Okay. Um, anybody XKCD fans here? You might recognize that cartoon. Okay, at least a couple people have seen this. I've doctored the cartoon a little bit. It's really hard to see, but one of them, one of the modules now says jQuery, another one says uh, uh, log for j, and and then another one says Spring for shell. In addition to that one component that somebody in Nebraska has been supporting since 2003. <laughs> well, unfortunately, log for j has hundreds and hundreds of developers, but it's a good example. A couple weeks ago, there was. Um, a 2007 Python um, vulnerability, in quotes, we'll call it, put it in quotes, because the, back in 2007, the developers did not consider, deem it to be a vulnerability, so they did not patch it. So in 2022, it became very popular to exploit through this, uh, through this vulnerability, again in quotes, because it was published back in 2007, nobody's defended against it. And that was in the uh, part of the Python main library for handling and unzipping files. So it's, uh, it, it's possible to have a overwrite files in your file system by crafting a malicious tar file and having it unzipped on the server because it does, it, it just, the writers of the package says, our job is to unzip tar files. So we don't care what the tar file says. If it says it goes out of this parent directory, we write it out of this parent directory, right? So are they right? Yeah, probably. Their job is to unzip tar files. Somebody else has to actually make sure that that makes business sense for them to do. But if you think about the tools that exist, whether it's SAST or DAST, none of them detected it. Um, and it's an interesting question. SAS tools started to detect it now, but if your SEA tool isn't detecting it, you have no idea if the open source libraries you're using, which may also uncompress a tar file, um, would, would have the same vulnerability because they consider that a coding problem, something that the SAS tool would catch. So it's a good example of where you have to be, have comp uh, comprehensive knowledge about what's going on and think about it. Um, for Log4j, I know that we had um, many vendors came out with tools to detect it. Not all of those tools were created equal. So I had a vendor give me a tool that said, this will detect log4j on your network. I asked them about it and it was, okay, well what it does is it looks in your system process table for the strings that the attack has. But the system process table will be executing whatever malicious payload the log4j attack had. So it's way, way down the stream and those attack indicators wouldn't be there anymore. So, um, so back to the uh, S-bomb. We've already said many, many times it's important to have an understanding of what you have and what compromises your system. This is why open source is becoming important is because there's 73% year-over-year year growth in the use of open source, which means that more and more open source is used, less and less custom code is written. There are 37 million open source components, 2.2 trillion open source package downloads, and 6 million new package versions introduced last year. Um, a third of them have known vulnerabilities. Um, only 6.5% of them are uh, non-popular because the big ones with the most downloads are the ones that get scrutinized and looked and exploited. 650% um, increase in supply chain attacks oh, and that's up from 430 and 220 so it's an exponential curve that you're having there. Um, my favorite one is the next one. Developers make suboptimal choices 69% of the time regarding upgrading third-party components. So that's because of the enormous volume of open source dependencies that are present, the incredible rate of time that goes on between them. If you're using GitHub Advanced Security, it will tell you that there's a new version available. It won't tell you what's the best one to solve the vulnerabilities that exist in that. 
right? Um, the, it has two different versions, but other tools, if you look at them, they have the capability of telling you, hey, not only do you, are you using this component, the one that's most leak likely, least likely to bork your entire software stack is this version. Or it can also, it, they start tracking metrics like um, uh, how many commits were done in the last year, how many developers made those commits, so that you can start looking for the ones that are actively maintained instead of using the one maintained by that one guy in Nebraska. Um, NIST came out with the securing the software supply chain recommended best practices for developers. And really all that is is mapping between this document, the executive order, and the NIST SSDF framework. But the majority of it focuses on the top left corner, which again has asset inventory and uh, vulnerability uh, repository. So you need to get the handle on that. Um, when you're thinking, uh-oh, now we're having trouble. <laughs> Is there a, um, it's plugged in. Let's see, did that save it? Yeah. Does not seem to have changed. All right, well, good news is we're almost done, but I don't know if you'll be able to see it. <laughs> All right. So, um, obviously don't use alpha, beta. We'll try to get through this before it shuts down. <laughs> um, don't upgrade to a more vulnerable version. Um, okay, so I had some expected questions. What is the minimum that you need? In my opinion, you need security champions. Developer, uh, secure development training documented understanding of what you're trying to include, and there it goes. So, um, <laughs> okay, so I know the rest, so we can wing, wing it from here. Um, the other thing is, I mentioned bug bounty once. Uh, why, why is that not a important strategic way to do things? It's great for finding stuff, but bug bounty programs are the, the designs that come from them are from the perspective of the bounty hunters. They look for things that they know how to find. They don't look for things that you need them to look for. So that's why a pen test by qualified people is better than a bug bounty program, especially since pen tests are recognized by most compliance frameworks. Bug bounties are not. Okay. And then uh, there was one more expected question that I'll try to get back to at some point in time, but uh, any unexpected questions? Yes, sir. I think that's a, it's, it's a very good question, but your metrics journey is going to be a journey. You're going to have to start with the, hey, this is the number of findings we have. A lot of the times it's being able to take the number of findings you have and pivot it into something actionable. So instead of saying that I have 5,000 um, issues of this type, you can pivot that and, and say, I have one issue that says I have SQL injection vulnerabilities in my system and then design a program to focus on that, and that will help. But the, the trick is, when you said going to upper management, as, as you start sending stuff up, the amount of information you can give starts to dwindle. I give my boss a couple of PowerPoint slides. I think it's four right now. He has to give his boss two. He has to give his boss a third of a page. So uh, you have to make sure that your AppSec risk scores map into your governance risk scores and accurately reflect on it. So, but it, it's a journey. You have to start with the, the counts. Then you have to start looking at the, how fast are we closing them versus how fast are they being created? Are we making, making a sustainable program? What's the average age that they're open? And then start building up more knowledge after that. Any other questions? Or did that answer your question? Yep. Okay. okay. Any other questions? 
Yes. If you ask, most of the time they will step up. I actually switched to security because I heard the CISO and the CTO saying, hey, we never really need to start thinking about application security at this company. And I'm like, you know, I went to school for that. I, I'll be more than willing to help you with that. So, but you, what you need to do is design the program and then design incentives for it for the people that you find. So if you find people that are interested in security training, you can do the, let's, let's, if you participate enough, score enough points or however you want to do it, we'll send you to DEF CON. If you find that there are people that are looking for supplements to their paycheck, go for cash rewards or something like that. Um, but you have to sell it to them. It looks great on your resume. It builds skills that will go with you no matter where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Cool. Thank you for your time.